<laughs> Coding is already in progress. So, okay. There's no way. So, okay, let's start. It's a great pleasure to have here Martin Elvis from uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I know Martin uh, since. I mean, I mean, the, the last century at least. Uh, and maybe there are people that know him uh, since even before. Yeah, okay, but we don't need to go into the case. Uh, Martin, uh, well, at that time I spent a short period with uh, working at CFA, I was doing PhD, and Martin was my mentor and introduced me to the secrets of X ray astronomy, and I owe, I owe him. Uh, uh, the expertise, let's say, that I have accumulated in these years, that all started over there, and uh, is famous uh, in astrophysics context in X-ray astronomy for his contribution to quasar astronomy. Uh, he did uh, seminal papers on uh, on on quasar uh, uh, emission mechanisms, no observation, and so on and so forth, and also for the. Uh, the, the Chandra X-ray Center, because it, it also made it a, an extremely relevant contribution to the software that was named Chow, I think, after you. <laughs> it was some was uh, well an idea of Martin and the Italians over there. And then at some point, he started to to get interested in uh, in other stuff uh, among those uh, the asteroids uh, and. Uh, is advertising a book, just if you didn't notice, and uh, to <laughs> even more to uh, the importance of uh, of the moon for the for the science at large, I would say. And so it's a pleasure to to leave the, the floor to Martin for uh, his talk on the protecting sites of extraordinary scientific importance for astronomy. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Andrea. That was very nice. Uh, it's a long title, and I hope you'll see why I've got all those different uh, pieces of it as we go along. So uh, when we talk about putting observatories on the moon, uh, I laughed at this idea until fairly recently. I hope you close this. No, 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 just that. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but the return to the moon by humans that is uh, being pushed very much by uh, the US and the Artemis program, but also in Europe, there are many um, big um, uh, initiatives going on with ESA for, in, in support of that. Uh, China also is going back to the moon, is going to the moon. Uh, and there's another a flurry of other uh, players, as I called in policy terms, both commercial and uh, and uh, government owned, uh, but are just landing on the moon. In the next five years, there could be a dozen landers on the moon. So far, we've had the Chang'e uh, landers from China and three failed attempts by, let's see, uh, uh, India, uh, Israel, and what was the other one I'm thinking about? Japan. 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 Just Japan. Right. Thank you. Just now. So it's not easy to land on the moon, but there are many, many people trying, and it will only take a few before things get complicated there. Uh, going to the moon with humans is very expensive still, and they will need a justification, which gives us a great leverage for actually getting astronomical observations done on the moon. Uh, there's this great saying uh, that James, I heard from James Carpenter. I'm not sure if he was quoting someone else. Exploration without science is tourism. So they've got to have a justification for spending spending all this money, and we are going, we can help supply it. So. Uh, so there are several ambitious concepts that are in development. I'd say they're in early phase development. They're not uh, something you could take to an agency yet. Uh, and we had a, this meeting in February this year at the Royal Society in London about astronomy from the moon, and got a lot of good publicity. There's a piece about it coming out in. Nature Astronomy soon just got accepted, and we're going to have a special issue of the Philosophical trans Transactions of the Royal Society, uh, and that will uh, bring together papers, uh, all the papers that were uh, written about this. So it's uh, the reason we ha we also have to worry about the law and policy issues, uh, and that's because we've all been burned by the uh, Starlink uh, 
uh, low Earth observation, low, low Earth uh, orbit uh, constellation of thousands, perhaps 30,000 bright satellites that when at their the wrong right angle in, illuminated, they are brighter than uh, they have been, they are a visible magnitude star. They're like visible magnitude stars. They should, they know, if there were thousands of those, it would destroy the view of the night sky for everyone, and it would certainly cause a lot of trouble for uh, the large area surveys, large sky, large fi wide field uh, telescopes like uh, the uh, Rubin Observatory and the uh, Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And that, oops. Ah, I wanted to go back one. There we go. This picture's got a lot of uh, press. This is these are um, tracks of these satellites crossing the field of view of the Desi Telescope, I believe. Anyway, we don't. There was, there was a lot of work going on after the fact to uh, raise awareness of this and to work with the company. To the, with the companies doing this, SpaceX is being very cooperative, but they are launching much bigger satellites. Uh, already, and uh, they will get yet bigger once their Starship uh, satellite works. So astronomers have been tipped off that we can really be uh, affected by some of these commercial space uh, activities and other space activities. And so we should think about other places where we might have a problem. And the moon is actually the next obvious place where we could have a problem. And uh, there are various uh, agencies and uh, Look, working to uh, starting to work on how to protect these sites that we will need for astronomy. So the first thing to do is to for us to develop the case for protecting particular places on the moon. Otherwise, we will lose an op opportunities, perhaps forever, that would otherwise be uh, make give us the access to building telescopes. It would make uh, this little James Webb Space Telescope seem like a toy. Right, is the, the possibility is there, but only if we protect these sites. And so that's why it may come made up this term sites of extraordinary scientific importance, because you need a, a, a label for these things. And we have to make our case that these are have enormous value for now and for future generations. So this is the, the pitch that I'm giving you uh, for the talk. So uh, I'll just explain how I got to worrying about this. I was worried, was been working with quasars and Chandra, as you know, for, for decades. And I worried about what would come next. So I got interested in the next set of great observatories to replace Hubble, Spitzer, and Chandra. And that got me oddly into asteroid mining because I realized the main thing to do was to bring down the cost enormously. Otherwise we will never get a set of great observatories all functioning at once again. And that got, and so maybe asteroid mining would be a way because uh, if you have commercial interests at work, then their motive is to make as much money as possible, and that means containing their costs. They won't make a profit unless it's cheaper to do things, and then that we could piggyback on that uh, new cheap technology. And of course, that got me to put, think about mining the moon because uh, asteroids are a little further off both physically and in, in time uh, from us being able to use them. So the moon was the next first place that mining might happen. And uh, so I studied where the resources were and I've been pointing out endlessly to people in different conferences that the resources on the moon are very concentrated. It turns out that's true also for asteroids in a few, small number of high concentration regions. And small number, by small number, I mean like a dozen. And when I say a small region, I mean a few kilometers across. So it's surprising that the moon is not that vast gray expanse of uniformity that we expect. A decade of mapping with various instruments has led to an understanding of where many of the um, resources lie and many of them are very restricted. And so that got me back into law and policy. And as I just explained, that gets me into lunar observatories because the concentration of sites for lunar observatories is also very small. There are very few of them. Oops. So these are the three things that have been main leading ideas that have come out so far for telescopes on the moon. One is the far side, where you want the radio quietness of the, of the far side, 80 dB reduction in radio noise compared with the front, near, near side. Uh, you also need flat and uh, smooth surfaces, and there aren't many of those on the far side. 
This is a map of the far side. Um, so we're far infrared telescopes. You can put in the cold traps, the permanently dark shadowed regions at the, at the poles. And they can be very cold and uh, or to, just because they're in a cold environment and they can be background limited out to 200 microns. And of course, uh, there are, you could well build bigger ones. I will uh, get to that. And then gravitational wave interferometers, or even just uh, as, a, as a seismic approach where you can have many uh, seismometers that are exquisitely sensitive and they can see the change in the shape of the moon as gravitational waves go through. This is not a second possibility. But uh, and the, the idea is definitely to fill in the gap between LISA and LIGO. LIGO, Virgo, Cagra. Oops, yeah, well, and so this is, uh, for that you need, again, the cold traps and you need the, you need the fairly sizable region. There really aren't very many places. I'll get to that. So let's talk about them in more generally. We want to explore the uh, dark ages with a cosmology telescope. The idea is to look at the uh, 21 centimeter line in absorption against the cosmic microwave background at redshifts of around 50, something like that. So you're down in the, in the tens of megahertz range. And the background from the Earth is uh, the human manufactured background is, is pretty bright there. So you want to go to the far side. Um, and then your dominant uh, source of noise is the galactic synchrotron radiation, which is pretty bad in many, much of the sky, but there are these dark areas where it's much lower. And that's where you would try to image the uh, likely uh, clouds that form, will later form galaxies, but sort of 10 to the million solar mass uh, uh, clouds of H1, which eventually will co coalesce to become galaxies and, and initiate star formation. But this is before any of that, before those stars or galaxies, you can still see the large scale structure. And that's the uh, ultimate cosmology tool, because, as Joe Silk would say, it has the most information because. You have a million times more of these clouds than you do of galaxies later on, and so you get a lot more data points. So at first, the experiments will be thought small, and you can put them anywhere on the far side. It really doesn't matter. Uh, but ultimately, to look at these galaxy seeds, you need roughly 10 arc second resolution, and that leads to a 200 kilometer diameter array, and that's more difficult because you need smooth areas over which you can drive rovers and deploy the uh, antennae, basically the dipoles. <coughs> and that means a slope of less than about 15 degrees is what you're hoping for. Uh, and where are you going to put it? Well, we, we uh, looked at, with my student, uh, we looked at about eight different areas that seem reasonably big and uh, reasonably flat. There aren't very many. <coughs> this is my student, Zoe Leconte. She's now at... Uh, uh, Durham doing sensible things with the Muse data, I think. But these, she, she made these maps uh, of these eight regions, and there we go. Three of them are ruled out because there's no way you can get away with just a 15 degree slope. Two of them are too small. Maybe you do that, you could use them as a trial if they were superior uh, sites. Uh, but you're left with just three. And I'll point out Mare Moscoviense in particular, uh, because we'll see it has uh, other uses later. And oh, it's here. <laughs> I rearranged my slides. I, it's a very poor idea to do that just before I talk. <laughs> um, as I said, there are um, only the luminosal resources of all kinds, almost all kinds, are concentrated in these modest number of regions of modest dimension. <clears throat> Helium-3 is much talked about as a, something you can get from the moon, but usually in terms of uh, being valuable as for fusion reactors, of which we don't have. Uh, so it, it seems like a very long-term prospect. I recently learned from another former student that it's actually uh, very valuable for quantum computing, because it, it's very important to get down to those two really cold temperatures. So it is actually very expensive, even on Earth now, and supply is very limited, and it's not obvious how to expand that supply, except maybe by mining the moon. So uh, she's actually involved in the, the startup to do that. So if you look at where the uh, helium-3 is, 
Uh, it, again, it was originally said to be very smoothly uh, distributed over the moon. It turns out uh, probably is not. This is from a, a paper by Kim et al, 2019. It's not measuring helium-3 directly. So apparently, it's co correlated with uh, titanium oxide. As a, so you can use that as a proxy. And uh, mm -hmm. they find these concentrated regions. And if you look closer up, this is Mare Moscoviensis, one of the uh, favorite uh, one of the better spots with the high concentrations uh, on a fairly small scale, 50 kilometers, say, with hot spots within that on a few kilometer scale. So that's where you'd start mining. It's stupid to start mining at low concentration and start at the most concentrate, highest concentration you can. Um, and that's the 200 kilometer long baseline we were looking for on a fairly smooth surface, as you can see. Uh, and overlaid is that I map of uh, uh, helium-3, and it's right there. And so if you have mining going on alongside your radio telescope, there's bound to be electrical noise generated by that mining activity. Uh, you're really scraping out large amounts of tonnage of uh, regolith in order to find a very small concentration, parts per billion, uh, of helium-3. There's a lot of noise going to happen. Uh, it's a it's a preferred not only because for helium three mining not only because it is um, high concentration but because you can't see the activity from Earth and if you can imagine that um, strip mining the front side of the moon producing a visible signature would be very upsetting to a lot of people I would think that was horrible myself but this one is on the far side so you could, it might be the first place people try to do helium three mining. So we need to be ready. <clears throat> this is already an issue that the, the radio loudness of the far side, because there's this J Chow, something like that, uh, relay satellite for Chang'e 4, which is permanently at the uh, uh, Earth Moon L2 point. Uh, so it's permanently over the far side and it's broadcasting. It is not broadcasting at the low frequencies that would be a problem of radio astronomy, but what is the electronic noise coming out of this? Just the, the electronics themselves operating, are they fully shielded? I believe not, but uh, from what I've heard. There are plenty of, this is just the beginning, there's plenty of other relay satellites uh, being uh, planned, constellations. The ESA is planning a moonlight, a constellation called Moonlight. You see multiple satellites around the moon for navigation and communications, and the same thing is being uh, initiated by uh, Lockheed Martin, a US company. They both plan to start their first launch in 2024. So they've already got that satellite basically built. And uh, that, and the electronic noise from that, if they haven't been told to minimize it, then they won't because it's not an engineering requirement. We have to get in there and define these limits of, of noise that we can tolerate for the system as a whole uh, and, and uh, try to get that into the consciousness of these companies. The Moonlight people are aware of the problem, but I don't think they have good input yet from the astronomers. All you need is a Faraday screen around the electronics, and these are long wavelengths we're talking about, so it's, it would be a very coarse thing and weigh almost nothing. But you still have to tell the engineers to put it in there. And once they have, once these are operational fleets, it's going to be very hard to change them, their design. It's going to be very hard to control the noise, therefore. And so we, we, we I think we have an immediate danger to the radio quiet zone on the far side of the moon that we must deal with in the next two, three years. Okay, the, the coal traps on the moon, probably many of you know about this. It's an astronomical fluke. The sun, uh, the earth, as you know, is tilted over 23 and a half degrees to the to the plane of the uh, sorry, of its orbit, the ecliptic, the ecliptic, oh, the ecliptic plane, excuse me. Uh, and that's why we have seasons. We don't have to explain that to you guys. <laughs> but the moon is not, it's tilted by one and a half degrees. So it has the mildest seasons you could possibly imagine. And that means that if you put a mountain on the top of the moon like that, it would be in permanent uh, sunshine never in darkness. So that's why the idea was called the peaks of eternal light back here by in the 1880s, before anyone knew if there were any. There are no, no permanent light, uh, peaks of eternal light 
on the on the moon, not, not eternal, but there are places which have just a few hours, maybe as long as 20 hours darkness before getting back into light over a whole uh, orbit, over, over a whole month. Uh, so you're very, we're very close to that approximation. There are some, ooh, uh, and that's because, okay, and, and because those are the, uh, their little ridges around the tops of craters and the craters are deep. And so because the angle of the sunlight coming in is a few degrees, one and a half degrees, you cast very long shadows. And uh, why is my, uh, the picture is not showing up. That's what's wrong. That's a picture of the moon in white. <laughs> Well, okay, imagine <laughs> this is a crater rim and that's a deep crater. What happened to an actual picture? This is what you get for changing uh, computers before giving the talk. Sorry about that. <laughs> so what could you do with for astronomy using these uh, craters? They are very cold. Uh, the deepest, some of the craters have craters within them and they are even colder and, and get down to 25 Kelvin. And if you've got a 25 Kelvin um, telescope, then it's uh, background limited only longwards of 200 microns. So this is a proposal by Jean-Pierre Maillard, uh, called, he calls it Allure, and uh, I've forgotten what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I put it there in case I forgot. <laughs> so that worked. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, he points out compared with the large building a large telescope in space, such as a successor to James Webb, where you need, uh, you know, James Webb has a tennis court size um, uh, solar uh, shield, right? Uh, heat shield. Uh, you probably need something even bigger if you want to go uh, and, and uh, to colder, longer wavelengths. He points out that compared with a free space thing like James Webb or bigger, uh, you, it, this could be much simpler to build and, just, and, so, and design. You don't need the sunshade, <clears throat> so deployment is, is much easier. Slewing is much easier from one, one target to the next. Uh, you don't need onboard solar panels. You get power from some other location, one of these peaks nearby, cable. Uh, you don't need to maintain the orbit. The moon does that for you very nicely. And so you don't have a lifetime constraint on that James Webb has, which luckily is 20 years, but it could have been tired. You don't need reaction wheels. You're using the, earth, the moon as, a, as a something to push against. So that's simpler for slewing. And it's a very stable platform. It's, not, it's inherently stable. And so um, you get more accurate pointing. And it's easier to service. Once you have human bases on the moon, it's easier to service. And you're only going to get this if there are human bases on the moon. Ah. But here, this is the new point. I'm pointing to the very purplish uh, valley places on the moon, which are 25 Kelvin. And you can see there's just a few little dots there. So there's only a few places you can put these, uh, this far infrared telescope. And uh, so we need to protect them and we need to decide which ones are the best for our, our purposes and which are worth, therefore, this thing is protected. Uh, gravitational wave observatories, that's this third case I mentioned before. I'm talking about this Lion version in particular because the other one I mentioned. This Lion is a 40 kilometer uh, equilateral triangle. It's got to be cryogenic, it works in a vacuum, and so those are good advantages. They come automatically on the moon. They have to, you have to manufacture this on Earth. It's a lot easier in some ways. There are only three large enough permanently shadowed regions. Oh, I didn't do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it just happened. It's okay. It's just a standard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm giving illumination to the moon. <laughs> to the people, right. Uh, there are only three such uh, regions, uh, Hayworth, Shoemaker, and Faustini. And uh, this is a map of the likely water content. Uh, and so purple is rich in water and uh, blue is le much less rich in water. So it looks to me like um, <clears throat> you want to avoid anywhere that, you don't want to put a telescope anywhere near where there's mining going on. Uh, mining is bound to involve a lot of vibration and traffic, and that's going to produce uh, signals in your uh, gravitational wave detector that you then have to 
get rid of. So it raises your background. Uh, so we want to avoid the two purple places. And I think there really is only the one spot, which is Faustini. I don't know who Faustini was. Does anybody know? It's a good place to ask. <laughs> okay, maybe it's the only choice. So this is where we, how we would narrow down what places we need to protect on the moon. We, we have to look carefully at the actual details of uh, what's, what's good. Uh, I've already said this. Oh, oh, I see. I know why. This is the point about the uh, permanent shadow regions getting cold. Is if, if you get to below 110 Kelvin, then water is, is stable in a vacuum. It doesn't it doesn't sublimate away, and that's the key temperature to look at. And this was a map <coughs> showing there's quite a lot of those uh, regions, uh, and they're and giving a rough scale for them. And they trap. In fact, these these have been when we say they're permanently. Um, shadowed. This means for the last four billion years, so that's pretty permanent. And that means that, and it, it, there are estimates that as much as a billion tons of water may be trapped in these in these places. And that sounds like a lot. Um, it's a key to developing a lunar export trade. And in, in, if you want to uh, send something valuable, water is valuable when it turns into uh, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, make rocket fuel out of it. Uh, it's also valuable for life support if there were space stations that you could export water to. That would be interesting. It also, of course, supports human bases on the moon, but that wouldn't be an industry. Uh, it's actually not that much. It's 400 Olympic swimming pools. I mean, it's a lot to drink, but uh, it wouldn't fund to keep an industry going for very long, I think. So it's, it's basically a scarce resource that's got to be used. Uh, as we'll, for which there are competing uses and for which we we uh, have to an interest in in uh, avoid and keep trying to keep some of them pristine for scientific purposes and also uh, we'd like to keep them uh, people uh, mining or miners away from our astronomy regions so we try to play find places that don't have water but maybe there aren't very many of those oh okay so uh, with my uh, a policy uh, collaborator, Alana Prolikovsky, and my ethics uh, collaborator, Tony Milligan. She is in now in uh, Missouri, and Tony is at uh, King's College London. Uh, we found in general about resources on the moon, like I mentioned, that they're mostly highly concentrated in a dozen sites, a few kilometers across, and there are many players about to enter. So this produces problems for governance, and it produces problems for science governance also on the moon. So, oh dear, again, something didn't show up. That was a scary long list of all the, the missions being sent to the moon and who is uh, working on them. And it doesn't show up, of course. Well, it's, it's, a, it's white on white, a very sophisticated audience. Okay, and all the ones within that dashed oval are all going to the South Pole. They all want to, to get to the water. And the three dashes are the three failed ones that I mentioned earlier. Dash. Okay. We've, we've looked at some detail of the, uh, the peaks of eternal life. We wanted to see how much power you might generate from them. That's a solar power. The point of them is that you could and get solar power more or less continuously. Uh, this is the map of the uh, that I that didn't show up on the previous slide, showing the ridges, which are here mark A, B, C of peaks of eternal light and one of the craters, Shackleton Crater, which is very, very near the South Pole, that is permanently in shadow. I've worked with Amir Ross, who's a student at uh, Harvard, and Phil Glazer, who's at the Technical University of Berlin, on uh, mapping these areas. And we find that they are indeed a very limited resource, of a few square kilometers. You can see a map, a map here that's from some other, somebody else's paper, uh, showing how they lie in thin strips on the ridges around craters and on the, map, on the ridges between the craters. So because of that small area, there will be competition and conflict very likely. Um, one reason a few kilometers is a very important scale is that if you land within a few kilometers of another spacecraft, you will, your rocket plume will blow up enormous amounts of regolith at high speeds, and that will be sent off 
shooting up towards and will reach the other spacecraft that landed and will could well harm it. And so under the Outer Space Treaty, that is uh, uh, at least it's considered harmful interference and that uh, could be a, that could trigger some kind of consultations or legal actions, but it's not obvious what. But it explains why a few kilometers is an important scale. So, for example, here is a map of the places NASA's chosen uh, uh, as candidate landing sites for the first human uh, return to the moon flight in the Artemis program. Right. So they chose it for the sunlight, which I mentioned, for being close to the uh, permanently shadowed regions, and that, that they needed level ground. And since you're looking at thin strips, a couple of hundred meters wide and a few kilometers long, and with, with deep uh, craters, kilometers deep craters either side, uh, finding a flat area which is boulder free is going to be challenging. So they've done a lot of work on that, and these are their favorite landing sites. Just a few locations um, of order a dozen. And the Chinese Cast Institute has uh, made a similar list of landing sites. And uh, from, from the Google Translate, uh, I can tell that they, they seem to have done a good job. And they come up, as you can see, with a very similar list. So uh, there's a lot of overlap between these two. About 50% of the sites are the same. So the first one or two landings won't have a problem of interfering with each other, very likely. But when you get to a few and they can't land close to each other, then you get into, into play, a situation where you have to have some kind of agreement about who can land where. So we have to get into that already. In the longer term, uh, more, this is, that was for the uh, late 2020s, a few years from now. Um, on the mid 30s, both, uh, both the US and Europe and China and, and China, Russia have, have talked about um, putting human bases on the moon, with not necessarily full time occupied, but at least uh, occasionally for long periods. And they used the same method to optimize where they would put them proximity to the uh, permanent shadowed regions, maximal continuous sunlight, level ground. And they come up with the, essentially the same list of few locations for bases. So again, and it gets worse once you have a base because that requires repeated landings in the same location. So you need agreement. So when you have rare and valuable real estate like this, it only takes two parties to start conflicts. And there are actually many players about to enter. And you saw that list of white on white of all the different players that are coming. <laughs> and so that's going to be a problem for governments. Uh, the first thing that might happen is there'll be a rush uh, to the peaks of eternal light to put up uh, solar panels, as many solar panels as high as you can. And so I've called this the San Gimignano problem. <laughs> uh, because, and if the scale is about right, you're gonna, you want to put up 100 meter tall uh, solar panels. And there'll be, uh, we studied that in another paper with another Harvard student, Sephora Ruppert, uh, who's now at Stanford. And uh, there we go. That's, that's what we've tried what's going to happen. And you can see because of the long shadows that uh, they, one tower will shadow them another one. And it's okay when it's just one tower, but when you have many of them, then, then they'll be permanently in and out of shadows, uh, which is exactly the effect you didn't want. That's why you went here to avoid being in shadow. So you've got to have some kind of governance of who can put panels where and how do we share power when because it fluctuates. If you have just one tower, it will be fluctuating all the time. So you need some power sharing arrangement. <clears throat> so we've already talked about these. And, uh, that's the only picture I could find. If you Google for uh, images of uh, dirty mining, the industry doesn't really like that. So it's very hard to find pictures with showing any kind of dirt. But of course, uh, uh, the dirt from mining will be lofted uh, by and in the vacuum of the earth, uh, of the moon, and uh, might travel significant distances. In the case of uh, rockets landing, which is the other one I mentioned, uh, some of uh, on Apollo 12, which has been studied, it turns out in detail, um, some of the bits of uh, uh, rock with, went uh, to so like 100 kilometers an hour and they're baseball sized. The smaller bits went faster and would even go into orbit. Yeah. 
so around the moon. So they can go very large distances. Probably mining won't be quite as dramatic, but if they, we don't know how far that dust and dirt could go. So we would need some kind of, and of course, if it did I'll fall on a UV telescope or an infrared telescope, it really wouldn't be good for performance. So we've got to find some ways of mitigating these problems that other uses of the moon will come up with. Uh, so for the radio, for instance, uh, we'd like to set up, we'd like to find technical means of improving uh, the, uh, the noise, like the Faraday cage um, idea, uh, and making sure there's no side lobes or harmonics from, mm -hmm. from the, uh, that will cause us trouble. Uh, both from both in or from orbiting satellites, but also nearby to the uh, big sites, the prime sites that we choose. In the infrared, we want to find which are the cold, coldest cold traps that don't have water in them, and, and prioritize keeping those uh, safe for astronomy. And how do we minimize dust and, and lofting from landing and takeoff? For installing landing pads of uh, concrete or some making concrete out of the, of the Lunar regolith, for example, much talked about. We haven't actually done it. For gravitational waves, we want to minimize the vibrations coming from um, mining. Other ways to do that with the design of the uh, equipment, controlling the ground traffic and uh, launching so to specific times, maybe, so they can know when you can uh, cross out that piece of your data stream. Uh, the man to get to those, uh, we need to generate those solutions, but first we need to generate uh, the requirements. Um, what are, what, how much noise can we generate, can we allow? And it, it, for uh, those satellite systems, it isn't just how much from each satellite, it's how much from all the satellites that are visible at any one time uh, from the radio, uh, far side radio telescopes. Um, we have to uh, find some way of limiting the use of the of the dry, permanently uh, shadowed regions. Oh, now this doesn't work. No, that seems to be the end of the talk because <laughs> that, that's interesting. There is a, there's a little more, but nothing. Let um, me mean. No. Ah, okay, that worked. If I touch the bottom left corner of the mouse pad, that works. <laughs> okay, who'd have guessed? Okay, so we need to uh, form some kind of community to protect these sites. There are people there's meeting in Padovos in, in June about radio astronomy, and they're going to have a day or so of meetings about this uh, for the, that case. But I think the first steps are to get self-organized in a fairly straightforward way, uh, involving this uh, horrible long name thing, uh, which has got a short. And I, oh, how do I go back? No, I can't go back. Oh well. Um, right, those beginning steps in getting organised, but we should try to uh, make make this much more public through the IAU Centre for whatever it was, uh, Dark and Quiet Skies. Okay, so there are other sciences that will also have their special. Uh, extraordinary, extraordinary sites, sites of extraordinary scientific interest, and we should work with those to get a to build up our case. That science is important, and if we lose, what's the value of the science? And um, Alana Kolakowski, who I mentioned, gave a very good talk at the, Royal, at the end of the Royal Society meeting, where she points out we have to we're competing against people who claim there are trillions of dollars of profits to be made out of uh, mining the moon, and we have to come up and say we have some other value and we will have lost unique possibilities for understanding the universe if we don't do this and that will be for generations to come and so that has a value too and we need to make that case there you are and that is the end thank you thank you so